So to analyze the uh, pumping part of the data, what I'm going to do is just chop off the recovery. And here are the data plotted. I'm going to go and use the Jacob analysis and try to get an estimate of the transmissivity. So to do that, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to just, uh, I'm in PowerPoint. So I need to draw a straight line and get the slope of a semi-log straight line and, and also get the intercept. So this is the straight line part of the, uh, of the data. And I'm going to just do it by drawing in these straight lines using PowerPoint. And I've got the data that are, that, that are plotting pretty similar to one another. So I did this ahead of time. And it looks like that line is going through these blue points for LAR2. And this line goes through the green points for LAR4. And between them, those two lines really sandwich the data sets. Okay, so what I can do is uh, calculate a value for uh, those two lines, calculate transmissivities and storativities, and then uh, that'll, maybe that is a, a bracket between the, the average value. Um, it looks like the slopes actually will be really quite similar and the intercepts only by, differ by, uh, by a fair amount or a small amount. Uh, and so I would just go through and calculate those two values. We can also get just a quick look at what we might expect. Let's just take this. This is a steeper slope. And so if I move it down here, there it's at 10. And I come over here. And there's one log cycle from there to there. So I'm starting here at 0. And I can just come across. And I see that this, one, this steep slope, the, the um, slope is, it looks like it's about 2.2 feet. And this one is a, a bit smaller. Okay, so that's what we would use in the Jacob analysis, and um, that gives us a, 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 at least a starting point in the, the overall analysis. Now, one thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is a, a little bit of a awkward point here, is that these data are all really quite similar, um, but the piezometers are at different radial distances from the well, and we would expect that the um, the drawdown would be a function of the radial distance, and the further away we were from the well, the less drawdown there we would be. And so ordinarily, when you plot data on a single axis like this, the piezometers would separate out. And in this case, they're not separating out by too much, but we can, um, we can plot this using a different axis, t divided by the radial distance squared. And this, uh, the radial distance to the monitoring well. And by doing this, we account for the differences in radial distances of the, of the different monitoring wells. And so I did that on the next plot. And so here are the same data uh, plotted. Let's see, let's go down. Plotted as t over r squared. And what we see when we do this is that we've got these two data sets, the purple and the green, uh, LAR4 and LAR5 uh, plotting together. And then these two data sets, LAR2 and LAR3, plotting together. And so we can fit those with these lines. And that looks like that fits those two. And that looks like that fits those two. OK, so now we've compensated for the radial distance, and we get these two grouping together. Now, the problem with this is that this actually causes the data to plot further apart than the previous one. And these two, these two piezometers that are grouping together here, um, LAR3, 4 and 5, these are the two piezometers that are furthest away, and these two other ones that are grouping together. So they have different radial distances uh, than these other two, but they have similar radial distances. And then these other two piezometers are um, are they have similar radial distances to each other? They're closer, and so it seems like this separation into these two um, plots, these two lines, is a result of being different radial distances away. So, nevertheless, um, I would go ahead and, and analyze this. What it will do is give you a, a different, slightly different um, look on interpreting the data. The, when you do this kind of a plot, the slope is still going to be 
um, proportional to the transmissivity, you still will be able to, well, it's inversely proportional. You'll be able to use the slope to calculate the transmissivity, and you'll be able to use the intercept of t over r squared, uh, that intercept, uh, you'll be able to use that in the calculation of the storativity. And this is in uh, one of the videos on pumping tests that shows you how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. One of the things that we see is when we do this plot and we, we draw out the slope that best fits these two data sets, these two and these two, we see that the, the slope on these really looks quite similar now. The intercepts will be different, but the slopes really look quite different. So um, that'll give us a, a, another estimate of the transmissivity, and I suspect that it's going to be really quite similar to the previous results. In fact, we can, we can check it here. Let's just check on what the magnitude of the slope would be. So there's one log cycle, and we come up, and hmm, actually this, this is a good bit flatter slope here. Uh, we said the other one was about 2.2. This looks about 1.6 or 1.7. Um, so that'll give us a, a, a bit of a it's, a, it's a flatter slope. So what that means is there's less drawdown. And if there's less drawdown, that means the transmissivity is higher. That's, that's the interpretation. So go ahead and, and, well, we'll be doing these calculations, but this is just how I would go ahead and pick these curves. Okay, so let's go down here. Uh, those were, that's the, the pumping data. And then here's the recovery. Oh, actually, before we go, before we leave that, one of the things that we want to do to, to, with this plot is to separate out different different permeability zones and these four these four permeab or these four data sets they've got the same semi log slope so it certainly looks like they have the same permeability they have different intercepts and that's going to cause them to have slightly different storativities but i think it's hard case to make that these are significantly different uh, permeability zones however um, look at the results here on the um, the LBR. This is LBR down here, and this is LAS. They're clearly plotting in a much different region, a much different, much flatter slope, um, and they're pretty clearly a, a different uh, a, in a different zone or a, a different entity. So um, I think it's not really too surprising that that would occur. LBR is quite a distance away, and LAS is up in the saprolite. So we know it's in different geologic material. Um, and these results just really confirm that. Okay, so let's continue on with the analysis. This is the recovery data from these monitoring wells, and we can go and do the analysis. It's plotted as T over T prime, and we see if we draw in the semi-log slope. So I'm looking at the this is the everything except these uh, LAR2 data look like it would it would work pretty well with a slope like that and the LAR2 might be a little bit steeper and so um, in this analysis remember with recovery if we plot it as T over T prime then this slope we can use to calculate the transmissivity and if we do that then let's see we have a bit of a steeper slope now and this looks like it's about 2.9 for 2.9 feet per log cycle for the slope and so that'll give us a bit lower transmissivity at least how I'm doing the, the fitting here oops raised the wrong one okay so there's recovery from the monitoring wells now what I did was to plot the data from LBR and LAS separately because it was hard to see them at the same scale as the other monitoring wells. And when you do that, you see that, I think uh, you see that the, um, well, here it's pretty clear, the LAS well, I mean, that's, that's clearly drawdown increasing with time, and it looks like a semi-log straight line is pretty, pretty reasonable. 
there's some scatter here, but uh, you know that's to be expected with small drawdowns. LBR, the distant well in the rock, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I think you could. There's a lot of scatter here, and maybe you would maybe you could convince yourself that something like that could be a best fit, and that there was a, a systematic increase um, with time. Um, but it, I think it's harder to say. I, I think what you would need to do to really get a good reading on LBR is to have a transducer, something that's going to measure it more accurately. Um, but there's clearly a signal in LAR2, or I'm sorry, in LAS1 here. Now, we, we, it's a semi-log straight line, so we might be tempted to analyze it, but this is in a different zone. And the Jacob analysis really is assuming that we just have one zone, one permeable zone. And so this is in a different zone. And um, so we, we won't do a Jacob analysis for this. It's not really going to give us a meaningful result. So we'll just really use this as an observation that we do have drawdown occurring in the saprolite. And maybe drawdown is occurring over at LBR. OK, so here are the results for the pumping well. This is drawdown as a function of time, also in minutes. And we can see that there is a similar, at least qualitatively, kind of effect where it's a relatively flat slope that steepens. And right in here, I think we've got a reasonable semi-log straight line. And then it starts to flatten out. OK, so we could go and uh, put a calculate a slope from the semi-log straight line. And let's see, maybe it's something like that. So something like that, that would give us uh, a slope and an intercept. So we could try calculating the transmissivity and the uh, storativity from that. Now, we know that uh, when we do this for the pumping well, that there may be problems. And uh, we know that if we try it with try calculating the stortivity in particular, that's almost never going to work out. Um, sometimes the transmissivity will, but the stortivity, oh, I, I've never seen a case where it worked out. And so you should try it and just confirm that that's the case. It should be much higher than stortivity really uh, could be. But the transmissivity, I mean, we see we see a semi-log straight line, and so we could do the calculation. And remember, it's inversely proportional to the slope. And in this case, the slope here, there's one log cycle. And we've got about 26, 27 feet, say, in a log cycle. Well, that's about 10 times more than what we got for the monitoring wells. And so that's going to mean that the transmissivity that we calculate is going to be about 10 times less, about one tenth of the transmissivity that we got from the monitoring wells. OK, so that's going to raise a flag. And uh, the, the thing that is probably happening here is this low apparent transmissivity is a result of a skin around the well, or, or just a low permeability rock around the well. OK, and, and that'll show up actually when you go and do the calculation for the, um, uh, for the well efficiency. And what I would do with that, uh, when you calculate the well efficiency, remember the, the well efficiency is going to use the Jacob analysis to calculate what the drawdown expect, what the expected drawdown would be using the transmissivity and storativity that you calculate from the monitoring wells. And so what I would do when you do that calculation is I would use the drawdown at 100 minutes, OK? Because you, you have, after 100 minutes, it's behaving this uh, semi-log straight line type of behavior that you expect for Jacob. And so you should be able to use that as an expected drawdown and then calculate the, the drawdown. Well, well you, should be, you should use the observed drawdown after 100 minutes, it looks like it's about 36 feet. And then you should be able to calculate the drawdown that's expected using the TNS from the monitoring wells. OK, and that'll give you then the well efficiency. OK, so there's 
Also something else that we can do with this um, well, with the pumping well, and that's to take a look at the longer term data and see what's happening is the slope is flattening out. And so this well certainly appears as if it's wanting to go to steady state. So remember the steady state specific capacity is the pumping rate divided by the drawdown at steady state. So we have a way of calculating that. We have an analysis that's on the worksheet. And it looks like here we might actually have a way of uh, actually determining it from the pumping test. So it looks like we haven't quite got there. Um, we may have to extrapolate out a little bit. And so, you know, maybe if we extrapolate this out, it's something like this. So it's a bit more than 50 feet. Um, and that's actually, that actually needs to go and, and flatten out to a, a flat slope. So it's, it's more than 50, but it's probably less than 60 feet of drawdown. So somewhere in there, we might estimate from this test anyway, at least from what we've seen over this duration of pumping, uh, what the drawdown is at, uh, at steady state. And so one of the things I'd like you to do is to, uh, is to do the calculation um, using the skin factor analysis that's in the worksheet. Do that calculation and estimate what the steady state specific capacity is and then go ahead and compare that to this, uh, this data that allows you to estimate the steady state specific capacity as well.